Oliver Twist, by Charles Dickens, adapted by Lisa Malaki, illustrated by Howard McWilliam. Part Eight, Chapter Fifteen, A Secret Meeting. Nancy was anxious to go to London Bridge on Sunday evening. Right before she left, Fagan and Sykes came in the door. Sykes was surprised to see Nancy wearing a coat and a bonnet. Where are you going? Sykes demanded. To get some fresh air, said Nancy. He pushed her down on the floor. You ain't going nowhere. Cook us a meal. Nancy had no choice. She prepared a meal as she watched the clock. Once midnight passed, she knew that there wasn't any point traveling to the bridge. Fagan kept his eye on Nancy. He thought that she had been acting strange the last few weeks. He wondered where she was really going that evening. Did she have another boyfriend? He decided to send Noah out to spy on her. I have another job for you," said Fagin to Noah. "Don't worry, it's nothing dangerous. I will pay you a pound to follow a girl," said Fagin. "One of my girls is Nancy. I don't trust her any more. I want to know where she goes, who she sees." Noah did what he was paid to do. He followed Nancy all week long. She never went far, and never saw anyone but Fagin's voice. On Sunday, Noah saw the door to her house open. She stepped outside and quickly walked down the street. Noah followed her to London Bridge. Noah saw two people approach Nancy right before she stepped onto the bridge. One was a young girl, and the other was an older gentleman. Noah hid behind some bushes and listened to their conversation. Why didn't you come last week? Asked Rose. We looked for you. I was held captive in my own house. Sykes wouldn't let me leave. Said Nancy. I tried. Mister Brownlow took his hat off. Rose, tell me your story, Nancy. You have my word that you will be safe. We need to find Monks to find out the rest of his story. If we can't find him, we'll need you to hand Fagin over to us. Nancy gasped. Never! I will not do it ever. He's the devil to me, but I still won't do it. You see, I have led a bad life, but I have led it with him. I will not turn any of them in, as bad as they are. Then, you must put monks into our hands, dear Nancy," said Rose. "But monks could turn against them," cried Nancy. "You have our promise," said Mister Brownlow. "We only want Oliver's story. We won't harm your friends in any way." Nancy trusted them. Monks is a young man, younger than thirty, but he looks old and haggard. His lips are swollen and a deep purple. His hands are covered with sores. His throat has a red mark on it. He looks like a bird of some sort. You can often find him at the three cripples. Mister Brownlow raised his eyes. I think I know this man. Rose took Nancy's hands. Please come with us. We'll keep you safe. We have money. You will have food and clothes. You want for nothing. My place is here. Signed Nancy. I'm one of them, and I must go now. She turned and made her way down the dark road as she wept. After everyone had gone, Noah crept from his hiding spot. And ran as fast as he could to Fagin's house. Fagin wasn't happy with the news. He sent for Bill Sykes and told him what Nancy had done. 
but he did not tell Bill about the part where Nancy professed her loyalty to them. Sykes flew into a rage. How dare she turn on us? She will pay for this. He rushed at home and pulled Nancy out of bed by her hair. Bill, what are you doing? What have I done? Nancy had never seen such hatred in anyone's eyes. As you don't know, he yelled. Figgin had you followed. We know about your meeting at the London Bridge. You betrayed us. He struck her face with the hand. She gasped for breath. If you know it all, then you know I didn't betray you or Figgin. They offered me money to turn Figgin in. I refused. Sai slapped her again, and she flew onto the floor. Bill, she begged. They have money. We can escape here. Start a new life together. I will sooner die than live with you any longer," said Sykes. He took out his pistol and aimed it at her head. Nancy cowered on the floor. Sykes raised his gun and slammed the barrel down on Nancy's head over and over again. Nancy took her last breath and died. In the end, no one could protect poor Nancy. Chapter Sixteen: The Hunt for Sykes. Mister Brownlow smiled when he saw the coach pull up in front of his door. Two men pulled a third out of it. It was Monks. How dare you do this to me? Said Monks. How dare you do this to us? Said Mister Brownlow. As they told you, you are free to leave. But if you do, We will come after you and take you to jail. It's either us or them. By what authority am I kidnapped in the street and brought here by these dogs? Asked Monks. By my authority, said Mister Brownlow. Mine alone. How could my father's oldest friend do this to me? Asked Monks. It is because. I was his oldest and dearest friend. That I must, Edward Leavitt. I shudder when I call you that, for you are not deserving of his name. Monks glared at Mister Brownlow. Tell me what you want from me. You have a brother," said Mister Brownlow. "I have no brother," replied Monks. "You know, I was an only child." I'm not a fool, Edward. I know what an unhappy marriage your father was forced into. You were born into that unhappy marriage. The marriage was so unhappy that your parents separated. You were young. Your mother was happy in her new life. So was your father. Fifteen years ago, when you were barely eleven, he met a new woman, who he fell in love with. What's this to me? Asked Monks. Mister Brownlow continued. When your father's relative died, he left him a large sum of money. He has to travel to Rome to settle properties. When your mother heard the talk of his new riches, she followed him to Rome. She was living in Paris at the time, and had spent all of her money. Monk spit his lip and took a deep breath. One day, after your mother met him in Rome, he died. Everyone thought he had no will, but you see, Edward, before he died, he came to see me. Monk gasped. I didn't know that. He brought many of his possessions to my home. He wanted me to sell them. And give you and your mother all the money from the sale. He then wanted to start a new life with the woman. He told me she was carrying his child, although I hadn't met her. He showed me a picture he painted of her. I still have it. 
But I couldn't find the woman. She had left for London the week before I visited your father's house to pay my respects. Meng's eye fell to the floor. The child was born in a workhouse. He was a sickly child. His mother died in childbirth, but as fate had it, the child eventually found his way into my care. I knew it was him when he came, because he looked exactly like the portrait your father painted. But before I could find out his story, your friends kidnapped him. Monks laughed. <laughs> you don't have proof that the baby born in that workhouse was my father's baby. But I do," said Brownlow. "I do indeed. Not long ago, after Oliver was taken from me, I travelled to the West Indies after hearing you moved there. I poked around. I discovered you came back to London right before my arrival there." I came back to hunt you down. I knew you would have the answers I needed. Mister Brownlow stood tall. You went to the place he was born. You got proof of the birth of your brother, and you threw that proof in the river. Mister Brownlow struck the hand on the table. You are evil. You even have the murder of a young woman upon your hands. I know nothing of a murder. How can I be responsible for something I knew nothing about? Said Monks. It was because the girl told part of your secret. You have brought enough sadness. You must promise to give your poor brother what is rightfully his. Mister Brownlow pushed an agreement over to him to sign. Once you have agreed. And signed the document. You will be free to leave. I will not be sending the law to chase you. My concern is only for Oliver. I hope to never set my eyes upon you again, Edward. A moment later, Doctor Lossburn burst through the door. The murderer will be caught tonight. Bilkside Stock has been spotted. He must be here in the area. Spies are hovering about, searching for him. A reward of a hundred pounds is offered for his capture. I will give fifty more," said Mister Brownlow. "What has become of Fagin?" "He's been caught," said Doctor Losburn. To find Sykes, they only needed to travel to a city part of London called Jacob's Island. Jacob's Island was surrounded by a muddy ditch, six to eight feet deep, and twenty feet wide when the tide is in. On Jacob's Island, the warehouses were roofless and empty. The walls crumbled down, and the windows were smashed. The doors fell into the streets. In an upper room of one of the deserted houses sat Toby Crackett and Tom Chitling. They sat in a gloomy silence. They were the lucky ones who escaped from the three cripples that day. Did you see how they got Fagin? He was kicking and screaming, but they got him," said Crackett. "Poor Nova, he climbed into a barrel to hide, but his feet stood out." Tom asked him, "What's that noise?" From far away, they heard a soft bark. You don't think it's Sykes and his dog? So it isn't stinking anywhere near here," said Crackett. "He's no gone by now." But they were wrong. In five minutes' time, Sykes and his dog walked through the door. "Murderer!" they shouted. Sykes looked awful. "They are coming for me. They are right behind me. I can't escape them." I can't escape Nancy's eyes. She's looking at me wherever I go. What have I done? Harry's voice could be heard from outside. We have him, boys. He can't escape us now. Give me that rope," said Sykes. "The tide is high. I can climb onto the roof and lower myself into the ditch." 
but Sykes was clumsy. As he tied the rope to his waist, he slipped off the roof and fell to his death. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part eight, to be continued in part nine. If you like this story, please like, share, and subscribe. See you then.